Welcome back, everybody. Good to see you. Hope everyone had a good week since I saw you last. And welcome back to the study of constitutional law. I got my hair cut. Got them all cut. And my haircut inspires me, you know, helps me think better. Just kidding. But uh, my haircut does inspire me because I noticed the license on the wall that my hairdresser has. Anyone ever noticed that? Yes. Can't cut hair in this state. Maybe in most states. Maybe in all states. I don't know. Yes. Certainly not in this state. Can't cut hair unless you're licensed to, to do so. Yeah, there was his license. And part of that license was professionalism. You know, a licensed hairstylist has a duty of professionalism. Just like we lawyers do, right? We've got a duty of professionalism. So that inspires me. That makes me wonder. A little question to think about before we start our prayer. Something to pray upon if you wish. Something to think about if you wish. Something to disregard if you wish. Because as I've mentioned, I open every class with a prayer, but it is not a required part of my class. Feel free to skip it if you wish. I'll take attendance, but not until after the prayer. I never take attendance before the prayer. Likewise, I not only believe in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I also believe in the First Amendment. So please don't consider this to be a required attendance or even a required time for you to speak or a required time for you to not speak. It's not a moment of silence. My voice doesn't need to be higher or louder than yours. Perhaps you want to kneel in prayer. Perhaps you want to kneel in protest. Perhaps you want to bang the desks and drown out my voice. I believe in the First Amendment. You've got every right to speak just as I do. Or if you'd like, you can join me in prayer. I'll be praying for you, or, and if you join me, I'll be praying with you. But the thing I wanted to, to mention, to kind of think about, is that professionalism is our profession. And the question is this. Does the practice of law, does being a lawyer have anything to do with faith and morals? Faith and morals in the practice of law. Do they have to go together? I gotta admit, when I went to law school, I never even thought about the topic. Went to Florida State from 93 to 
1996 FSU Law. Gave me a great education, at least I think they did, but left me never pondering that particular question, faith and morals. Sure, we studied professionalism. Everyone's studied professionalism, right? You've studied the ABA recommended rules of professional conduct. Maybe you've even taken the time to study the particular rules that were enacted by your particular state where you're planning on getting a license. Certainly, we need to be professionals, don't we? Just like my hairstylist. And I mean no disrespect to hairstylists. After all, my hairstylist got me looking beautiful. So I mean no disrespect to hairstylists. You can laugh if you'd like. I mean no disrespect to the hairstylist. When I respectfully ask, can our profession rise above mere professionalism? Is that our only standard? Is that your only standard? Is that the only standard you're going to hold yourself to? mere professionals. We talked about state constitutions in our last class and how the federal constitution and the whole panoply of federal constitutional rights can be viewed as a floor, as a bare minimum, and perhaps a state constitution, so long as it never sinks below the floor, so long as it never offers anything less than the full panoply of federal constitutional rights, could be viewed as a way to rise above, to grant even greater rights. And so I ask, what about you? What about the profession of practicing law. Can this be a profession that rises above that bare minimum, that bare floor of professionalism? Can faith and morals be part of a law practice? I gotta admit, one of the reasons I'm thrilled to come here and teach here was long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> your particular law school was called the University of Orlando. I don't know if any of you happen to remember that. And the University of Orlando was your predecessor in the school that was struggling to get AB, ABA accreditation, but of course your law school has long since been accredited. But back then, it wasn't affiliated with the Adrian Dominican Sisters. It wasn't affiliated with the Catholic Church. And I had lost track. I was looking for some law library resources. Didn't have it at my office back then. Didn't have it at the law library downtown back then, so I drove over to this campus, and almost inadvertently as I drove in, and I saw that circle, and I saw our Blessed Mother there, that statue that's still there today, as you enter your campus right there by the fountain, you can see our Blessed Mother. And I kind of inadvertently just kind of slammed on the brakes, because something had gone through my head that had never gone through my head before. And I'm embarrassed to admit, it had never gone through my head before, because I consider myself a faithful Catholic. And I consider myself a good lawyer, but I never considered that the practice of law could be a way of being a faithful Catholic, could be a way of being a servant of God, that the profession of the practice of law itself could be a service to the Lord our God. Think about that. Can that be true? Can that be true for you? Again, long ago, I was once in a hospital a loved one was ill, and on that hospital wall was a beautiful painting of a surgeon performing a surgery, which my loved one was about to have. But in this painting on the wall behind the surgeon, guiding the surgeon's hand, was Christ. What a beautiful image that was in that painting on that hospital wall. Can Christ be guiding the hand of a surgeon? Well, of course. Here's the question I'd like you to think about. Can Christ be guiding the hand of a lawyer? Can God's Holy Spirit be guiding the words of a lawyer? Can God our Father through our Blessed Mother Mary be an inspiration, perhaps even a co-counsel to a lawyer? Something to think about. But of course you could just Swear to the oath of professionalism, just like my haircut. Or, if you'd like, maybe you could aim higher. Just something to think about. Something to think about as I open our class with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by that confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my Mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. All right, today's topic, government, transparency, and accountability, or stated somewhat differently, Florida's sunshine laws. I kind of like calling them Florida sunshine laws because, you know, today's maybe an exception because it's winter and the cold snap is here. And when I say cold snap, I'm not talking about that limited edition from the brewery. I'm talking about the weather. Cold snap is hit, and yet here we are in a sunshine state where it's usually quite sunny. So government accountability, open government, access to records. That is something we want to talk about because it's so prevalent in so many different parts of the text of Florida's Constitution. But to start the discussion, we've got to ask ourselves, do we even need to mention such a thing in the Constitution of the state of Florida? After all, we've heard of FOIA, right? We've heard of the Federal Freedom of Information Act. You find that at Chapter 5 of the United States Code, right around Section 552, I believe. So what do we need open government, government records, government access, freedom of information, in Florida's Constitution, if we already have a federal law on that topic. And the first thing I would point out is the limited scope of FOIA, the limited scope of the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Almost specifically, or almost limited to federal agencies that are part of the executive branch. Perhaps a few exceptions can be found, but for the most part, when we talk about the Federal Freedom of Information Act, we're talking about information that we can receive from federal agencies that are part of the federal executive branch of government. So that leaves out state governments. Yes, it leaves out the state of Florida. What else does it leave out? It leaves out those governments created by and residing within a state. For example, counties, cities, towns, townships, villages, the villages. Have you been to the villages? Strange name for a town, that's why I like to mention it. But leaving out all these sub-national governments, not subject to FOIA. So we have laws such as we're about to study here, Florida Sunshine Laws, that provide us with open government, freedom of information, government accountability, government transparency, and access to government meetings and records. So some questions you may keep in mind as we look at this material. First, does it provide a Floridian with any greater rights than an American as a whole? We know that Americans benefit from the Freedom of Information Act. Do Floridians have greater rights under Florida Sunshine Laws than an American has under the Freedom of Information Act? Spoiler alert, yes. Yes, they do. Pay attention and you'll see, and I will help to highlight, some of those differences where we have greater government transparency and greater rights as Floridians than Americans do as a whole when it comes to open government, freedom of information, and access to government records and meetings. So where then do we find these sunshine laws? And the answer to that question is that we find it within the text of Florida's Constitution, but we also find it in various statutes that both interpret and, to a great extent, expand upon those rights that we find in the text of Florida's Constitution. Now, Florida's Constitution sunshine laws, especially in Article 1, quite clearly state that they do not, NOT, do not require an enabling act. To what do I refer when I mention an enabling act? An enabling act is legislation that is passed after a phrase is inserted in or amended to a state's constitution in order to make that amended or inserted phrase operative and active. 
some amendments to a state constitution require an enabling act. Florida Sunshine Laws, on their base, in Article One, state that an enabling act is not required. It does so by stating that it is self-executing. So when we see the phrase self-executing in the text of Florida's constitution, we know that an enabling act is not required. Now, what's the big deal? What's the difference? Who cares whether or not there's an enabling act? Well, one reason we might care is because an enabling act requires our state legislature to stop and to pass the law. So there's a delay between adding that right and amending it and grafting it into the state constitution and having that right effective. A second reason we might care is there's an opportunity during that implementation of the Enabling Act for some sort of revision or interpretation. For example, there was a recent ruling in the past seven days from the Supreme Court of the State of Florida as to whether or not a felon must first satisfy all the financial liabilities arising out of the felony before the felon's rights to vote are restored here in Florida. As you may remember, a very recent amendment, less than six months old, to Florida's Constitution says that felons now have their rights restored once they've satisfied all, and I don't want to misquote the exact language of the amendment, but once they've satisfied all their obligations or something along that line, look at the exact language of the amendment and you'll see what I mean. It could be subject to interpretation. It could raise the question, does that mean in addition to serving all time served that the felon also has to pay all court costs and other financial liabilities that arose out of the conviction? And it was such a debatable question that it came before. The Supreme Court of Florida and the Supreme Court of Florida this week said that yes, that can be required when you put together this enabling legislation. Now, if you didn't need the enabling legislation, there wouldn't have been that delay, and there wouldn't have been that opportunity for that answer to be had from Florida Supreme Court. So an enabling act could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, depending on your particular point of view. But when it comes to Florida's sunshine laws, no enabling acts are required. That does not mean that we can't pass additional legislation but the requirements for that legislation is that it can't contradict the self-executing language within Florida's Constitution. So long as we don't contradict the self-executing language, Florida's legislature can pass additional sunshine laws. And indeed, as you'll see in this presentation, they've done so. First, before we get to statutes, let's take a quick look at a particular example of Language that didn't require an enabling act. Here is Article 1, Section 24 of Florida's Constitution. You can see it on the big board. Here we see that access to public records and meetings is a constitutional right within the Declaration of Rights, Article 1 of Florida's Constitution. Specifically, it says, in relevant part, every person has the right to inspect or copy any public record made or received. This section specifically includes the legislative executive and judicial branches, counties, municipalities, and any government entity. So within the plain language, every type of government within Florida, large and small, is included. None are excluded from that language. That's the plain text of the Constitution, and just one example of a sunshine law located therein. There's also a plethora of statutes, which, as you've examined our chapter, I hope you were able to get through the long list of statutes and stay awake, but I gave many of them to you verbatim. Here's one example or a summary thereof. There are three basic requirements of Florida Sunshine Law. One, meetings of public boards or commissions must be open to the public. Two, reasonable notice of such meetings must be given. And three, minutes of the meetings must be taken and properly recorded. Don't misinterpret the phrase recorded. We're talking about the minutes. If you're familiar with Robert's Rules of Order, you've seen the phrase minutes before. Minutes are not an OT, not a verbatim transcript of what transpired. Minutes look more like an outline. 
Then again, your law students, I shouldn't say an outline. I've seen some of your outlines. They might as well be verbatim transcripts. Think, think of an outline of someone who's not a law student, okay? <laughs> when we talk about an outline, we're talking about usually sentence fragments instead of full sentences. Rarely, if ever, a full paragraph, right? A, a jotting down of ideas in an outline form. This is the kind of minutes that are required. So what do we mean there in part three when we say recorded? What we mean is preserved. What we mean is enrolled. What we mean is kept in the ordinary course and scope of business of that particular entity. So that the public can access them later. So those are the three basic requirements of our Sunshine Law. Meetings of public boards and commissions, open to the public. Reasonable notice of such meetings must be given, and minutes of the meetings must be taken and properly recorded. One of the things we've got to take and properly record is attendance today. So I'll start the attendance sheet over here if you don't mind. Thank you. All right. And please pass that around. So the Sunshine Law. How do we interpret this? There are laws that we go out of our way to interpret in the negative, to interpret to not have rights. One of the examples I might give, if I had to give it a, a law that I interpreted the negative, that we go out of our way to make sure there aren't rights, be an attorney fee provision. Have you studied attorney fee entitlement statutes in any of your classes? The American rule is the common law that we adopt from merry old England and carry forward here in America to such an extent that we put our name on it, the American rule. The American rule says that win or lose the litigation, you're paying your own attorney. There can be statutes which shift attorney fee liability. But because those statutes are a derogation of the common law of the American rule, those statutes are strictly construed. In other words, if we can find a way to not award you prevailing party attorney fees, then you're not getting them. That's the opposite of the modern sunshine law opposite because the modern sunshine law is interpreted with a bias toward public access with a bias toward revealing to the public with favor given to the public and disfavor put upon the shadows the sunshine law looks for sunshine wants things to be in the light wants things to be revealed and disfavors hiding things confidentiality of things, unaccountability of things. For example, in this 1973 decision, the Supreme Court of the State of Florida says that sunshine laws having been enacted for the public benefit should be interpreted most favorably to the public. Another example, a 1974 decision of Florida Supreme Court of Palm Beach versus Gratison says that Florida sunshine laws should be construed so as to frustrate all evasive devices, flowery language, but powerful language. Another example, 1983, Wood versus Marston, again, Florida Supreme Court. There, the court says that Florida sunshine laws must be broadly construed to advance its remedial and protective purpose. So what if it's doubtful? What if we're not sure if it should be in the public eye, if it should be in the sunshine? If it should be open and obvious, if it should be transparent, if we're not sure, then we err on the side of open. We err on the side of transparent. We err on the side of revealing it. We err on the side of making it public. So that's how Florida sunshine laws are interpreted. And does any of this matter to you? I believe it should. Because these are valuable rights that a Floridian has. You happen to be in Florida right now, even if you're leaving, you're Floridian now. If you're staying, you may be a Florida lawyer, and these are rights you could enforce in court. And if you plan on being a Florida lawyer, you might take something called a Florida bar exam. Anyone ever heard of that? A couple of you have. Have these topics, Florida sunshine laws, it ever shown up on a Florida bar exam? Yes, it's been on a Florida bar exam every year for the past three years. Now, we're studying from our textbook. The other textbook I mentioned is a wonderful textbook, the one we're not using. It was published last in 2013. It has almost 800 pages in it. How many of those 800 pages does that textbook address 
to these topics. How many pages in that other textbook address for sunshine laws, open government, government in the sunshine? There's 800 pages, who wants to guess? Do you think maybe 700 of those pages? 600, 500, anybody say 400, 300? Anybody say zero? That's right, that book contains zero pages on a topic which has shown up on the Florida Bar Exam every year for three years. So I don't know. For silly reasons like you might want to pass the bar, or you might be a Floridian who should know their own rights, or you might be a Florida lawyer who knows how to enforce other people's rights. For silly reasons like that, I think this is a topic we should cover. So I'm going to spend at least this class on it and part of the next class. I think it's that important. And so does Florida Supreme Court, as you can see from some of the language on the big board. This is part of our fundamental rights. It's in our Declaration of Rights. It's in Article 1, and it's scattered through other articles of our Constitution because of the importance that Floridians put upon this right. Remember, Florida's Constitution is not an act of court. It's not an act of the Florida legislature. It's the words of the people. These are the rights Floridians want. And these are the rights that are being broadly construed, not narrowly construed. So where does the sun shine? Are there parts of government where the sun don't shine? And I apologize for my language, because my mama always said, when you're in public, you don't talk about places where the sun don't shine. But I guess I've got to do that today. Are there parts of Florida government where the sun don't shine? Well, we talked about FOIA, the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Were there parts under FOIA? The Federal Freedom of Information Act, where the sun don't shine? Yes, there were. How about the U.S. Congress? Does the Freedom of Information Act give Americans the right to transparency from the U.S. Congress? No. Congressional records, can I obtain them under a FOIA request to the Federal Freedom of Information Act? No. What about Article 5? Courts. What about federal courts? What about the U.S. Supreme Court? What about District Courts of Appeal, I'm sorry, what about district, United States District Courts, what about a federal court system? Can I use FOIA against the federal judiciary? No. So FOIA is only empowering Americans to access from the executive branch of the federal government and executive branch agencies that are federal. Is that limitation applicable to Florida Sunshine Laws? The legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch. Does the sun shine on those Florida branches? Let's take a close look. First, let's look at the legislative branch. Does the sun shine there? And the answer is yes. In addition to that text and language from Article 1 of Florida's Constitution that was on the big board earlier, take a look at the big board now and look at some additional language. That is in Article 3. Article 3 of Florida's Constitution talks about the legislative branch, creates Florida's legislative branch, empowers lawmaking by Florida's legislative branch, and contains some of the following language. Section 4, quorum and procedure. The rules of procedure of each house of Florida's legislature shall provide that all meetings of each house shall be open and noticed to the public. But that's not all. It also requires meetings to be open and notice to the public whenever there's a prearranged gathering between more than two members. So the Florida legislature is not in session. Does Florida Sunshine Law provide us with any rights? Yes, it does. You read our chapter, you read the opening to our chapter, and you read about the pork chop gang. Is there anyone here who's a card carrying member of the pork chop gang? Any pork chop gang members in the crowd? No one's going to admit. You like pork chops, but that doesn't mean that you're a card carrying member of the pork chop gang. But you read about the pork chop gang, which is a historical fact. Long ago, before the 1968 Florida Constitution that we're studying now and all the amendments that have been passed from 1968 to the present, before then, there was a prior constitution which said approximately one county, one vote. So counties like Miami-Dade, who had thousands of people to represent, got one vote. And some rural counties up in the Panhandle, which had basically nobody living there, 
still got one vote. And it was a group of those counties that would get together. You read the text. Where did they get together? I love it. It's so quintessential. Old South Florida. Where were they, where did they get together? Do you remember? A fish camp. They all got together at a fish camp. Or what did the reporters say they spent their days doing there? Drinking whiskey and playing poker. It's a hard knock life. Who owned the fish camp? You remember what you read? A lobbyist owned the fish camp. And who assembled, hung out at, even spent the night at the fish camp? And the other hotels mentioned in the text. The members of the pork chop gang, the pork chop gang members were elected. They all had one vote. And they met in secret. If you weren't a member of the pork chop gang, you might have stopped by the fish camp, but you weren't participating in the pork chop gang's activities. The pork chop gang had a purpose. They got together. They were a voting block. They voted together. They voted alike. How did they come to such agreement? How were they able to keep that block together? Secrecy. They would discuss the issues of the day, not in public, but at the fish camp, among themselves. No public input. No prying eyes of the media or the people they were elected to represent. To stop things such as the pork chop game, we created broad laws such as this. Now, obviously, the Florida legislature was not in session when the pork chop gang was playing poker, drinking whiskey at the lobbyist's fish camp. But thanks to amendments like you see on the big board behind me, Floridians have the right to notice and to observe, to know that that meeting is going to happen and observe it. And those who participate have the duty to keep minutes and record them preserve those minutes. Is that a right that Americans have as a whole? What if two or more congressmen want to get together? Can they do that? What if three or four like-minded congressmen, I don't know, want to call themselves a squad or something like that and get together, exclude the public, and decide how they're going to vote as a block? I'm just speaking hypothetically. Who knows if something like that could ever happen? Could it in the federal Congress? Yes, it could. Dare say that it has happened hypothetically. Does that violate the federal constitution? No, it does not. What if instead the members of the squad were not part of the US Congress? What if they were part of the Florida legislature? Could they behave in the same way that they do today? No. Why is that? Because it would be a violation of Florida's sunshine laws. So Florida does have greater rights. There's one example. Government shines, the sun shines on a government, even for Florida's legislative branch. The Florida legislature can pass laws, and those laws can create exceptions to sunshine. But there are strict requirements for those laws. Here's the three most important to take away. When the Florida legislature passes a law that is an exception to public access, that law must specify the public necessity for the exception. That's rule number one. Got to state it on the face of that law. What if it's a really important public necessity? We just didn't take the time to write down what that was before we passed the law. Now we have a facially unconstitutional law. The law on its face, if it is spelling out an exception to public access, it must specify the public necessity. For that exception. What is that necessity stated on the law? Number two, the law must be no broader than necessary to achieve what? A given government purpose? An important government purpose? More than that, the stated government purpose. The purpose stated on the face of the law when we analyze it in court to determine whether or not it's unconstitutional, that's the only purpose we're going to to consider just that purpose. And number three, the single subject rule applies. No other subject matter other than the exceptions and their enforcement may be included within this law. So, sun must shine on the operations of the legislature, and the legislature's laws must allow the sun to shine. The legislature can 
enact exceptions to the Sunshine Law if these three strict requirements are met. So back to the big board, legislative, executive, judicial. Does the sun shine on the legislative branch? We'll make it red. If it does, it will make it green. If it does, what is it? Is it red? Is it green? Is it red? Is it green? It's green. For those of you who are colorblind, it's green. I made it green just then. I just clicked the button and it became green. I have that power. I've got that power. The power to entertain or to help you sleep. I don't know which one I'm doing right now. So it's green. The sun does shine. On the Florida legislature, even though FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, does not shine upon the U.S. Congress. What about the executive branch? Does the sun shine on Florida's executive branch? As to the executive branch and local government collegial bodies. I'll get back to that in a minute because I want to define that. As to the executive branch and local government collegial bodies, any gathering of two or more members to discuss a matter that may foreseeably come before that body. That's considered a public meeting. There's got to be prior notice to the public, and then the meeting itself has to be open to the public. This is true for the entire executive branch of the state of Florida, but it's also true for local government Collegial bodies, what is a collegial body? A collegial body is any entity of local government where a decision is made by a vote of that body. So anytime it comes up for a vote, we're gonna call that entity a collegial body. So maybe you call it your city council, maybe you call it your board of county commissioners, Maybe you call it whatever you want to call it. But if it makes its decisions by taking a vote among its members, then it is a collegial body and it is subject to sunshine. The sun shines upon that body. So there has to be prior notice whenever they meet. There has to be an opportunity for the public to attend because it's got to be open to the public. Now there are exceptions, of course. And in this overview that I'm giving you for the past 20 minutes and probably for the next 30, we do a surface view of these exceptions as we get into deeper in the actual case law precedent that we see in our case book. We're going to see these exceptions in action. And we'll take a deeper dive into them. But for now, note that exceptions do exist. In general, there's just two types of exceptions. One is the use of staff exception. The other is the fact-finding exception. And again, the details are to come. But for now, the use of staff exception is when the collegial body, get ready for this, uses its staff. Whoa. Details to come. The other exception is a fact-finding exception when that collegial body is simply trying to determine the facts. Later, those facts might yield some lawmaking. But for now, we're just trying to determine the facts. There, that can be an exception to sunshine. More details to come. Note for now that there are two general categories of exceptions. Use of staff and fact finding. Both exceptions ultimately are going to turn on whether there was actual or apparent decision making. So we can't cloak the real decision makers and pretend they're not the real decision makers and avoid the Sunshine Law. And you knew that because the Sunshine Law is broadly interpreted. It's broadly interpreted to avoid all ways of getting around it. So you knew that. So back to the big board. We've got in green the legislative branch because here in Florida the sun does shine. But what about the executive branch? Shall I put it in red because the sun doesn't shine here in Florida? Shall I make it green because here in Florida the sun shines? Is it red? Is it green? Is it red? Is it green? It is green. The sun does shine. And that leaves us with one branch of government left. And I didn't cover that. Anyone here unfamiliar with the fact that there's three branches of government? All right. 
Sorry to skip over such details. But let's look at that third branch of government here in Florida, the judicial branch. That's you after you get sworn in, right? Let's look at the judicial branch. Can the sun shine on Florida's judicial branch? Remember in the Federal Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, that's no help in getting records or access to court. What about here in Florida? Under Florida's constitution, the Florida state court system. Well, the answer is yes. The sun does shine. And we know that from the plain text of our constitution. Remember in that Article One Declaration of Rights, it said there that every person has a right to inspect or copy any public record made or sheet. This section specifically includes the judicial branch. How do I know it specifically includes the judicial branch? Because it's in the text of the Constitution up there. And again, like I did last class, I apologize. I know when you study federal constitutional law, you never open the plain text of the federal constitution because that wasn't part of the curriculum, right? But it is here in state common law. The text of the constitution is something we're going to study. And the text says that specifically included in Sunshine is the judicial branch. So do we make that green too? Of course we do. Does that mean there are no exceptions to Sunshine? No, we've already alluded to a few. And as we get into our cases in our case book, we're going to see some of those exceptions in action. But here in this overview, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the separation of powers between the three branches of Florida government. How does the separation of powers limit Florida's sunshine laws? First, let's look at the legislative branch. And there, Florida's legislature is authorized to enforce access and exceptions via the legislature's <coughs> own rules. This is an important distinction, as the courts will not, NOT, will not become involved in interpreting and enforcing the internal activities of the legislature. So when it comes to our state constitution, is that a difference? Perhaps, what if hypothetically our state legislative branch issued a subpoena, right? And what if hypothetically our state's executive branch, its highest officer, now as you know here in Florida, the state's executive branch's highest officer is not called a president, right? We don't have a president of Florida, called a governor, right? governor of Florida, what if the executive branch to the governor didn't like the subpoena from the legislative branch? Well, I would suggest, based on the big slide behind me, that that probably would be non-justiciable. Did I enunciate that wrong though? Non-justiciable, meaning that it's not something for a court to decide. It's a political question, not a judicial question. Is that true under the federal constitution? And indeed, based on current political events, we might have a federal answer to that federal question quite shortly, and it might be different than what you might see here under Florida's constitution. Let's look at separation of powers and the executive branch. Florida's sunshine law does not, NOT, not apply to those powers of the governor and cabinet, which derive from Florida's constitution. Here in Florida, our chief executive is the governor, as I just mentioned. Our governor has a cabinet. Under the federal constitution, our cabinet members, federal officers elected by the people? No, under the federal constitution, they're not. Under Florida's constitution, our cabinet members, constitutional officers who have been elected by the people? Yes, yes they are. This is not unique in Florida. Many state constitutions do the same. In the federal system, the president's cabinet, if chosen wisely, are like-minded individuals who are advancing the president's goals. They're also serving at the liberty and discretion or the pleasure of the president and can be dismissed by the president. That's the federal system. Here in the state of Florida, in our Florida Constitution, our cabinet officials are independently elected. That means they might be of a different ilk than the governor, by which I mean a different political persuasion, 
by which I mean your governor might be Democrat and your cabinet member might be Republican or vice versa. Could even be that they disagree on matters of policy. They've been independently elected. They don't serve the pleasure of the governor under Florida's constitution. And Florida's sunshine law does not apply to those powers of the governor and the cabinet which derive from Florida's constitution. The slide behind me has one example. In this one example, the governor and the cabinet are exempt from Florida's sunshine law and dispensing pardons and other forms of clemency authorized by the text of Florida's constitution in Article 4, Section 8. If you look at that Article 4, Section 8, you'll see that they get together, they review records, and they vote as to whether to grant clemency. What if you're concerned about what's going on here? What if you'd like to read those records? What if you'd like to attend that clemency hearing? Well, unless the governor's cabinet decide to give you those records and to welcome you into that meeting, you have no rights under the Sunshine Law to those records or to attend that meeting. How could that be? The canon of construction of Florida's constitution that yields this result says that when Florida's constitution specifically states a manner of doing something, then that is the legally required method of doing it, and varying from that method is unconstitutional. So you might enact some enabling statutes that expand the Sunshine Law, but they cannot contradict the plain text of Florida's Constitution, so long as that text spells out with specificity the way of doing a thing. If the text of the Constitution states the way of doing a thing, then that truck text overrides, has precedent over, prevails and trumps any statute to the contrary passed by Florida's legislature. That's how we get this particular result that I've put under the category of separation of powers regarding Florida's executive branch. So that leaves us with one branch then to discuss when it comes to separation of powers and the Sunshine Law, that would be the judicial branch. And for the same reason that I discussed, being the canon of construction stating that when the Constitution says a way to do a thing, doing it in another way is unconstitutional. For that reason, Judicial nominating commissions that the Florida Constitution creates for nomination of Article 5 judges, they are not subject to the Sunshine Law. So perhaps you're on the short list for a District Court of Appeal opinion, and perhaps you may have said something in your interview that was pro-life, and perhaps you're wondering whether that's why your name didn't get submitted to the governor. Well, you'll never be able to use any Florida Sunshine Laws to get any access to the notes or records or to attend the Judicial Nominating Commission meeting to get to the bottom of that particular question, you'll never know because the Sunshine Law doesn't give you that kind of access to a Judicial Nominating Commission. Why? Because the plain text of Article 5 of Florida's Constitution spells out exactly how a Judicial Nominating Commission goes about its business here in Florida. And it doesn't contain Sunshine. Therefore, despite any act by the Florida legislature, sunshine won't apply there. The sun won't shine upon a Florida Judicial Nominating Commission meeting or its notes. So there we've talked about a brief overview of the sunshine law. And in so doing, we've used about half our class. So now is a good time to take our 10 minute break. When we come back, I'd like to do some drills with you. I want to throw some questions on the big board, see if you can answer them. questions about Florida Sunshine Law. In so doing, I'll allude briefly to the written materials because that's how you will know the answer. But again, I'm still skimming the surface. It's when we're done with the drills that we'll finally look at the case law precedent in the case book. But I want you to be able to take the knowledge you learn from these cases and apply that knowledge. If there's one valuable skill you can take from law school, it is this, to be able to take statutes, case law precedent, and law treatises, and distill that information into a usable form 
so that when a client has a specific question and there is an answer, you're able to give that answer. Likewise, if you're litigating and a client has a specific position, then you'll be able to take that position, to take the facts of the case and apply the law and argue to the judge, not in some academic way, not in some dissociated way, not in some unimpassioned way, but to actually have an opinion and to argue that opinion. So that's why I like to do drills. And I try to make the drills fun. I know the word drills makes them sound really boring. So some of my drills I give really cool names to, like later in the semester, we're gonna play a game show called Name That Red. Everybody loves the game show. So I try to keep you awake for the drills, but I think it's a great way to see if you are able to distill this information into a usable form. And if you're not, that's a great wake up call to yourself to go back to the cases, go back to the statutes, go back to the treatises, and get a better understanding. So let's take our 10 minute break. And after that, I'm gonna ask, how well do you understand Florida Sunshine Law? And we're gonna find out. See you in 10 minutes. So we have to go here, we're here to the next class packet, which is why I'm so sorry. You we went up a little bit over yesterday and I see you out for last week. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, right is the whole thing. Yeah. Right is the whole thing. Yeah. We'll get you out on time. Okay. Thank you. You got so, it. Thank you very much. Yeah. No. Yes. Oh, how dare you? I'm not going to be. Well, I'll be here next time. So, I want to see you. Well, mission. I can turn it online. Right? Well, sure, yeah. Okay. I don't have to like hard copies. Uh, okay. It'll be on the website. I've got photocopies to hand out here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey, I'm posting. All right. You know what you were talking about? Love it. Love it. Yes. Wise man. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. Every other one helps. Yep. Yeah, I got it. 
I like to come every night. 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 I like to
and they are going to meet privately to determine their strategy, how they're going to discredit and impeach Florida's governor. Any constitutional infirmity, yeah. anything unconstitutional about that, you suggest yes. For, um, for Florida's constitution, yeah. You suggest yes for Florida's constitution. And indeed, that is the correct answer to the hands on which constitution we're talking about. Certainly, under Florida's constitution, this behavior by what I guess the hypothetical was calling the impeachment caucus, this behavior would be unconstitutional. And that would be because of Florida's sunshine laws. Unlike the federal constitution, anytime there's a meeting of two or more, Members of the House of Representatives or members of the Florida Senate, and maybe two or more of these Florida elected officials, got to be public. There's got to be prior notice. The amount of time given for the notice that is distributed to the public has to be reasonable. It's got to be a reasonable notice prior to the meeting. Then at the meeting, the public has to be allowed to attend. Also, Somebody's got to make minutes of that meeting, right? And what happens to those minutes? They've got to be recorded, in this instance, in the official register for Florida's legislature. Because that's the particular entity they've been elected to. So when the public reviews the records of the Florida legislature, they will find these minutes, even though this was not an official meeting of the entire Florida House of Representatives it was just some like-minded representatives. So can like-minded representatives of the Florida House of Representatives have a caucus? Well, sure they can, but it's more transparent, it's more open. There's some sunshine when it comes to the Florida version that you might not find in a federal caucus in the U.S. Congress. So that's the correct answer. And you knew that from the text. You knew that from reading about the pork chop gang, right? Next question. News reporter Dan sends an unsolicited email to Florida Senator I am framed. I like to bump the names. I am framed gets reporter Dan's email in I am framed's official email inbox. But you know, I am framed didn't ask for this email. I am framed did not respond or reply to this email. I am framed did not draft this email. I am framed certainly didn't ask for the particular attachment that's attached to this email. And believe you me, neither I am framed or anyone else in this room would want to be in possession of this particular attachment. Oh, it is at the very least, embarrassing to be in possession of it. And reporter Dan shows up with the news cameras rolling, demanding public access to Senator I am Frame official Florida email inbox where Dan sent it. So the question is, must Senator I am Frame make the embarrassing attachment public. Who can give the answer? So you think, I am afraid you could just bury this. And although that's not the right answer, I would say that there is a temptation, right, to think that might be the right answer. Now, we're asking under Florida law, under federal law, the outcome might be different. But in Florida law, we're going to interpret the Florida Constitution's sunshine laws to avoid making things secret. We're going to interpret it broadly to make as many things public as we can. Yes, you've got a comment. Um, isn't it, since he received it, isn't there something with if they receive whatever it is that it's public? Well, yes. And you remember from the text of the Constitution that if it's generated or received, so it's not, not true that the government had to create the document or create the data or create the file or create the form in order for it to be subject 
to disclosure under the Sunshine Law. Under Florida's Sunshine Law, it's irrelevant. Irrelevant whether you create it or not. And you know that from your readings. Let's take a look at NCAA versus AP. That's the uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association, right, versus the Associated Press. Look at this particular language here. A document, quoted from the opinion that you're ready, a document that is used in the course of public business, this is used in the course of public business, is a public record under the definition in section 119.011 sub 12, that's Florida Sunshine Law, if it was made by a public official or, or if it was received by the official. Made or received. So in my hypothetical, news reporter Dan knew exactly what news reporter Dan was trying to do. Picked a pretty effective way to do it, right? So I would suggest that the correct answer is almost certainly yes. So I can't call your no answer completely erroneous because I won't give a firm yes, as you see on the big board. I give an almost certainly yes under these facts. And let's see why I go with an almost certainty, yes. The reason has or comes from the dicta we see in the case we read, NCAA versus AP. That particular dicta over here, the point overlooked in the NCAA's argument, however, reading really again from the case, is that the records in this case were examined and used for an official state purpose. The records in this case were examined and used for an official state purpose. The opinion goes on to say that they may, and that's why I call it dictum, they may have been more tempted by the argument if there had been an accusation that it was something personal in nature. For example, they gave in the dicta of this opinion, a state employee might be operating an email on their own and viewing websites for personal reasons. And in dicta, they indicate that they're not answering that question, but that that might have been a different case, says the dicta of this NCAA versus AP. You saw that when you read it. So my hypothetical does trot the line between the actual facts of NCAA versus AP and the part of the hypothetical and the dicta of NCAA versus AP. So they've left the door open. It's possible, the dicta says, that perhaps that might not be something that is disclosed. But with that said, don't be fooled by the fact that the government received it but didn't create it. That's not something that's going to protect that document from public disclosure. It doesn't matter whether or not the government created it or just received it. Either way, it's subject to sunshine. Likewise, as you saw in NCA versus AP, the government agent went on to a website and viewed information as part of the job the agent was doing for the government. The agent didn't hit print, the agent didn't hit save, but the agent went onto the website and saw the information. That alone was enough to mean that that information had to be disclosed. It was subject to sunshine. There was a hand up and I almost missed it. Yes. So the rule yes. says that they have the right to strike any record they don't receive in connection with the official business of right. the public office. In connection so, with the official business, right. which right. is the language that dicta harped upon, wasn't the basis of the ruling in NCAA versus AP, but they did mention, but now your point from that language. So my question is, so any spam mail that every public officer receives is public record? Just junk mail your email. Oh, you got it. I love your question. What about the spam? What about the junk mail? What about the unsolicited mail? Yeah. I would say that it's not enough for the government to simply say, if I didn't ask for this email, 
it's not subject to the sunshine law. I think it's clear that that alone is an insufficient defense and is insufficient to warrant a lack of disclosure. With that said, we might go a little bit further. Perhaps it's not the official government account. Perhaps it's the private email account. Perhaps it's spam in the private email account. Perhaps it's spam that's usually read by the government employee at home, but they happen to open it today on their desktop. Now, is that enough for disclosure? We don't have a firm answer from NCA versus AP, but certainly the dicta would suggest that that's not enough. But it's important for me to couch my answer with those phrases that the dicta suggests, because you saw the opinions from the Florida Supreme Court. I don't have them on the slide a minute ago, but we're going to interpret sunshine broadly. If there's a way to make it public, we're going to make it public. If it is questionable, we're not sure whether or not it's public, we're going to err on the side of making it public. So if you're taking a Florida bar exam and it's questionable, you'll want to point out the purpose of the Sunshine Law was to avoid situations like the pork chop gang. The purpose of the Sunshine Law was to make as much public as possible. The purpose of the Sunshine Law is to take these excuses and strike them down and render the information public anyway. Is there some point where it's not public? Of course there is, but don't rush to that point when you're arguing your Florida bar question answer, because the purpose of the Sunshine Law is the opposite, is to make things public. I present Florida Sunshine Law as an example of what we talked about in our first class with that laboratory democracy, where a state through its constitution, without denying its citizens any of the full panoply of constitutional rights afforded in the federal constitution, federal laws, and the federal system, in addition, can grant greater rights to its citizens. I present to you Florida Sunshine Law as such an example. Because unlike FOIA, which clearly you wouldn't get the spam, it's not so clear under the Florida Sunshine Law, is it? Was there another hand in it? Yes. Well, I thought it had to be in conjunction with, you know, like it says, retained by a so public agency in yeah. connection with public business. I am framed that it used for public business. He just received it. I hear your argument. I am framed can certainly argue that this wasn't for public business. But wasn't it? his public email address. Wasn't it his official email? Yes, it was. Can't he explain? I only am in possession of this because this reporter with the cameras rolling just sent it to me. I never asked for it. Which of those results better furthers the goal of the Sunshine Law? Make it public? Allow the public official to explain why it's irrelevant or why he's in possession of it and let him explain away his embarrassment or let's just hide it from the public. Let's turn off the sun. What's better? Should we create a blanket exception anytime a government official is willing to say, no, no, that these emails, they didn't have anything to do with my work. Nobody gets them. Is that what the Sunshine Law was all about? I suggest <laughs> no. I suggest the Sunshine Law was the opposite. I suggest the Sunshine Law is not trying to say, let's leave it in the hands of government. Government decides what government makes public. And the people just say, yes, government. Thank you, government. We appreciate that government. Thank you, government. I suggest the purpose of Sunshine Law was the opposite. Government, if you got it, if you read it, if you have it, if you created it, if somebody gave it to you, it's mine. And if you think it's not, you, government, bear the burden to show me in a court of law that it's not. And if it's debatable, then it's mine. That's what I suggest is the purpose of the Sunshine Law. Yes? Is there a burden? Is it correct for me to think that we can only show one of the two exceptions? Well, the Florida legislature has the right to draft new exceptions. And we outlined on the board, and it'll come up again in our questions here. 
what are required in order to have an exception. But to answer your question, exceptions exist. Exceptions are disfavored. The government entity who thinks they're entitled to the exception has the burden to assert the exception, uh, exception and then has the burden of proof of all the elements of the exception. If they either don't assert the exception or they assert it and fail to meet any part of their burden, then the exception does not apply and the records are public. So that's the result of Florida Sunshine Law. I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry, one more time. Well, you see, the, the best hope, you mean the government's hope? Yes. Yes, the, the government would need to identify an exception, assert it, and then meet the burden. They don't assert an exception, the record is public. If they do assert it, then you can challenge that. And as the public seeking the record, you don't bear the burden, the government does. And the government's got to prove its case. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. Did I miss another hand? Okay. So what do we think of this example? If we put something in the government's hand, what's the general rule? Is public. it now public? Yeah, that's public. Absolutely. absolutely. The general rule is if we put it in the government's hand, it's public. Have you ever traded emails with someone who's working for the government of the state of Florida or a local government and you ever traded emails with that individual and seen their signature line, invariably that signature line contains some language about due to Florida's broad sunshine laws, anything you reply with may be subject to public inspection. Almost invariably, every Florida employee for the state, and for counties and cities and local governments have a disclaimer like that in their email signature line, and rightfully so, because the default answer is if it comes in the hands of a Florida government, it has come in the hands of the people of the state of Florida. It is public, it is a public record, it is in the sunshine, it's subject to the sunshine law. How's this question? I like this one because you know me, I love good talk. Mike and Sean are two lifelong friends. Not only are they lifelong friends, but each one of them has been elected, and they are currently members of the Vero Beach City Council. Now, Mike and Sean love a good taco. So just as they've done many times throughout their lifelong friendship, they decide they're going to Taco Bell to enjoy Taco Tuesday. Indeed, there was a city council meeting on Monday, and that's where they agree that they meet at Taco Bell the next day on Tuesday, enjoy Taco Tuesday, and then afterward they'll head off to the meeting of the Bureau Beach City Council that's held on Tuesday. So under these facts, have Mike and Sean violated Florida's Constitution? Are tacos unconstitutional in Florida? Is there a possible sunshine law violation here? Yes, yes, indeed, I would say it's quite probable. Indeed, I would say if I were Mike or Sean's lawyer, I would tell Mike or Sean not to do that. I would tell him not to do that. But Arguably, yes, okay, this so violates Florida's sunshine law. I can see why, but I yeah. have an issue with this. Because you have an issue with it. Can you imagine Mike and Sean at Taco Bell? All of them have an issue with it, too. Why? Because in that case, that if they're friends, if they're not discussing official business and they just want to have instead of Taco Tuesday, maybe it's Whiskey Wednesday. You mean to tell me that two friends can't go out and have shots of whiskey and just chill out and hang out? It could very well you know, be under friends. these facts that two friends can't just go and hang out. Just as the members of the Pork Chop Gang might have argued that they were just a bunch of friends having whiskey and playing poker at a fish camp that, oh, is that really owned by a lobbyist? Who knew? They were, being they were being shady. But look at these facts. We've got a break in the meeting. The meeting began on Monday and continues on Tuesday. And two voting members of that collegial body are going to get together on their own in between the meeting. Okay. So what if As their attorney, I would advise against it. Okay, what if we change the facts? What if we change the facts? That might change the outcome. How are you going to change the facts? Well, the meeting is over. 
Okay. Or this is like just tradition before the meeting starts. It doesn't matter whether it's before or after. But it's not part of the meeting. Okay. And there are two friends hanging out. Well, here's problem number one. Okay. Any gathering of two or more elected officials meets the definition of meeting. That's a meeting. So under these facts, there was a meeting on Monday of the city council, and there was a meeting later in the evening on Tuesday. But earlier in the evening on Tuesday, when Mike and Sean went to Taco Bell, that, that was a meeting. The definition of meeting is broadly interpreted because Florida's Sunshine Law is broadly interpreted in favor of an outcome that yields transparency, government accountability, and making documents and meetings public. So here, we've got the three meetings described. And one of those meetings which took place in between the other two, foreseeably there could be a topic discussed that might come up for a vote. I've got three hands in the back and one at the front. I will not miss any of you in the back. Yes. I just want to make sure that I understand the, yes. the law correctly. So it looks really bad for Mike and Sean. Yeah, but, you know, from one perspective, it looks yeah. quite innocent. The but two the, men love Taco Bell. The text from says, another perspective, yeah. it does look really bad. The text says that any gathering of two more members to discuss a matter that may be foreseeable. Okay. So if they're not meeting yeah. to discuss, if, because we don't know what they're discussing. Okay. So, so do we the want to on rely discussion? on the government to tell us the purpose of their meeting? No. Do we want the caucus to say, well, by coincidence, when we were done with our meeting, we started to impeach the governor. But I'm telling you, that meeting, <laughs> it never came up. Well, I'm not saying when, <laughs> when did the violation actually occur? Who do we defer to? Do we defer to openness, accountability, and public? Or do we refer to the government and the powerful telling us, the people, how we should be? No, I understand that it, you defer to the openness, but I'm wondering when the violation of the Sunshine Law would occur upon the discussion. Is that when it would occur? If, when they were discussing something that could foreseeably enter the, the whatever the, the third I was? say once they met and that meeting took place without prior public notice and without the public attending, that was a violation. So uh, if you're a school board member yeah. and you're school friends with the school board members, it doesn't matter when we meet. If it's for a Christmas white elephant party exchange. So two whatever, school board members. Two school board members, two teachers. I mean, because they, they could be discussing. could be a discussion about what they're going to vote on, then yes. They need to publish the white elephant Christmas yeah. party. Yeah, that's why if you meet a Florida government official and they happen to have email on their phone, they've got two different emails. They've got their personal and they've got their public and their public and everything that's being received and everything they send is also being recorded and stored and kept for posterity by their particular employer because of the sunshine law. Yeah, I, mean, so, I, know, yeah. I know that, but they have the private emails, so they can't have that private discourse. But in the actual meetings, they have their private lives versus the public life. Like okay. if they're just friends at a Christmas party. That's but what is it fair for the government to say, I'm one of the three voters on this collegial body. I'm such good friends with this other voter that we're going to get together with their own private meeting in between two meetings. And you just trust us. We're not going to talk about any government business. No need for you to know where we're meeting. No need for us to keep minutes. No need for the public to attend. Now, what I just described is the polar opposite of the goal of Florida Sunshine Law. And when the courts tell us we're going to interpret Florida Sunshine Law broadly, what they mean is we're going to make the description I just gave you illegal. When they say we're going to interpret Florida Sunshine Law broadly, we're not going to tolerate the government telling us that's not really a meeting or it's not foreseeable that we're going to talk about things. We're going to make the government be on pins and needles. They're going to be on their toes. They're going to be on their best behavior. They're going to bear the burden to a certain exception. They're going to hold the burden of proof in court to try to meet that exception. That's how Florida Sunshine Law has been interpreted quite consistently from the 1970s to the present, especially after the 1992 amendments. So if you happen to ever get elected to a public office in Florida, you'll have a government in the Sunshine Manual, and you'll be told what seem to be crazy and ludicrous things, such as on a break of your collegial body, when folks are heading to the restroom, make sure to go one at a time, Try to avoid having two members of the collegial body in the same restroom at the same time. Does the Sunshine Law say government workers can't go to the bathroom at the same time? No. But lawyers like us understand that we're interpreting these laws broadly. 
and that we want the public to have the confidence of knowing that the government is in the sunshine, that it is public, that it is accountable. So that's why you see things like that in the government of Sunshine Act. Is it overbroad? Is it overboard? Is it overbroad? Is it too much public accountability? Is our government too accountable to us? Can a government be too accountable to us? Have the citizenry ever said, oh gosh, my government is just too accountable to me? So far, that hasn't been the outcry from Floridians when they passed these broadly interpreted sunshine laws. The outcry has been the opposite. But I still got three hands waiting, and then three more came up. I'm not missing anybody. Who's first? Anybody know? Well, okay, whoever thinks they were first, please go ahead and talk. <laughs> I know. I hope we're all right. Okay. What's the extent of the notice and openness? So, for example, if Mike said Taco Bashan on his public yes. calendar, Taco Bashan and Taco Bell at 9 o'clock, whatever, and Sean said the same thing on his publicly viewable calendar, and that's notice. That might just be enough. And those issues are being fleshed out case by case. In our casebook, we look at the Darnell Ray cases. And I presume, since the name Darnell Ray shows up in two or three cases there, that they're one and the same Darnell Ray. But you can see how in those Darnell Ray cases, issues are being explored, such as Alachua County thought there was an emergency, so now we give one day notice of their meeting. Was one day enough? Darnell Ray went to court. Who had the burden of proof? Alachua County. They had to prove that one day was enough. And we see that uh, we're holding the government accountable. The minutes were kept. That's great in your hypothetical. In your hypothetical, the minutes were kept on the back of the top of the napkin. Is that sufficient? Explain those why, government. Why were the government, why are your minutes only on top of the napkin? Could somebody thereafter type up the Taco Bell napkin in order to keep them in the Bureau County official records? If not, why not? Government, you're bearing the burden here. Why is it that no one can type? Why is it that the napkin is all you have? So what happens then is that government lawyers advising the government says, hey, unless you've got a good reason not to type up what was on the back of the napkin, let's get it typed up. Because we're going to interpret the subchannel as broadly. We're not going to say the government did it, therefore it's right. Quite the contrary, under the Sunshine Law, we're going to say the public has a right to full disclosure. Why didn't you provide it? So I hope that answers that question on that hypothetical. It's a great hypothetical because you can see it happening, especially on Taco Tuesday. <laughs> so I like the question. But who is who is next? Okay. Well, yes. So essentially, it doesn't need to happen on Wednesday. Let's say the next day. So Taco Wednesday. Well, that, that would be a harder fax. Under these facts, we had the city council meeting on Monday, we had the city council meeting on Tuesday, we had Mike and Sean at Taco Bell earlier in the day on Tuesday. But you're changing the facts now. Instead, Mike and Sean are going to go to Taco Bell on Wednesday. That certainly helps quite a bit, doesn't it? But I would say we need more information. What exactly happened at the city council meeting on Tuesday? Was the agenda exhausted and all items on the agenda were fully and finally decided? If so, when Mike and Sean get together on Wednesday and can meet the burden of proving that they're lifelong friends and can meet the burden of proving that they love to celebrate Taco Tuesday on Wednesdays, then they can also meet the burden of showing that there wasn't a foreseeable issue to be voted upon because all issues were resolved off the agenda and there wasn't even another meeting scheduled of the full city council. So again, the burden is going to lie upon the government the outcome is going to be in favor of the people unless the government can meet its burden. So I, I think that's the best answer I can give you in your hypothetical. The answer would be yes or no, I'd give it a qualified yes, that one's okay. A qualified yes, that's constitutional, what you described. But of course, since the Sunshine Law is broadly interpreted in favor of the people, I can't give you a firm answer on that. But there's some more hands up. Yes? What about text messages? 
So yeah, I, I, I'm sure that you can text someone, and you know, if you Mark and Sean are talking and they happen to discuss something yeah. over text messages, then those messages would become public records. But is it restricted to the text messages between Mark and Sean on that date and time frame, or all of their text messages ever, or all of their text messages between each other? Right, and your text message question is a great one. Let me break it down step by step. We know from NCA versus AP in the textbook, in the casebook, that was about 11 year old opinion, and there they were talking about how it doesn't matter whether the records are on paper or whether they were digital. There they talked about digital in the form of email. There in that case, they also talked about digital in the form of a website where from Florida, the NCAA's attorney said Gray Harris, Gray Robinson, were able to log on the internet and view records that were physically in the Carolinas. And they held in NCAA versus AP that the emails became public record and that the Carolina papers became public record. Note that those papers never left Carolina. Note that they were never physically in the hands of a Floridian, but an agent, specifically an attorney from Florida State University, acting on behalf of Florida State University, used the internet to view that record. Therefore, that record was a public record here in the state of Florida, even though that record never physically existed here. So applying those holdings to text messages, which are not specifically addressed in NCA versus AP, I feel extremely confident in answering that text messages too become public record. Your question asks further, which text messages? because you're talking about Mike and Sean again, they're buddies, they might text about different things. And what you would be advised by the manuals and by the attorneys, if you were elected to public office, is that you must, and that's how they would phrase it for you as a public official, you must keep separate text message accounts. And any and every official text message between you and anyone else in government should only be in the government account, because that government software is going to save and record and keep for posterity any and all texts you make or receive. Indeed, you'll probably get an ethics violation if you don't use the government text message. Just a weird, crazy hypothetical. Nothing like this could ever happen in the real world. But let's say a Florida elected official decided to put an email server in her basement. Obviously, no one would be so irresponsible to ever do that if they were an elected official. But here in Florida, that would be an ethics violation, and it would also be a violation of Florida's sunshine laws, because that would show a deliberate intent by that hypothetical Floridian who put an email server in her own basement and used it for official purposes. That would be a violation that would subject that Floridian to criminal pen penalties. We have to quite literally lock her up. Now this is just a hypothetical, not referring to anyone in the real world, but that is perhaps a different outcome, perhaps, than if some, uh, some elected official on a federal uh, basis would do that. But of course, no official would ever do something irresponsible like that, so that's just a crazy hypothetical. But what was the next question? That shut down all the questions? Sorry about that. Okay, but I have more questions. Next question. Oh, here's those cases I wanted to remind you about, about how Florida's sunshine laws given an expansive reading by Florida Supreme Court. You saw this already. Having been enacted for the public benefit should be interpreted most favorably to the public. So if we've got a debatable question, what was the purpose of the meeting? Were Mike and Sean just hanging out eating tacos? Or were they discovered, discussing government business? We're gonna err on the side of ruling that it was government business. Mike and Sean, have a hefty evidentiary burden to bear, and rightfully so, under the Sunshine Law. Sunshine Law should be construed so as to frustrate all evasive devices. You know, we're lifelong friends. We always go to Taco Tuesday. How could we possibly talk government business there? Sounds a lot like an evasive device. Sounds a lot like the pork chop gang. Was it just a coincidence that before every legislative session, all the members of the pork chop gang would gather at the lobbyist owned fish camp and suddenly all their votes were aligned thereafter. Sounds like the kind of device that's trying to evade the sunshine law. Maybe Sean and Mike's Taco Bell 
Top of the Tuesday of month is the same. Such MO must be broadly construed to advance its remedial protective purpose. My goal as a judge interpreting the Sunshine Law is to somehow rule in favor of the government. So if you're the government, or you're the lawyer advising the government, you let your client know. If there's a sunshine accusation, the court's goal is to rule against you. It's your goal to try to meet the burden of not losing that case, or better yet, to try to make sure that case is never brought in the first place. Here's a question for you. I like this one. Florida's Attorney General, in defending the constitutionality of a statute, this statute created an exception to Florida Sunshine Law. And now this statute is under attack. Allegedly, this statute that creates an exception, allegedly, it is unconstitutional. Under Florida's constitution, we have an elected official who must take the position of defense. That elected official is Florida's attorney general. Anytime you as a lawyer litigating in the state of Florida allege that an act of the Florida legislature or Florida county or Florida city is unconstitutional, you are required to send a formal notice to the office of the Florida attorney general. The attorney general has the option. They can intervene in your case or they cannot intervene. That part is optional by the attorney general. But under Florida's constitution, this part is not optional. If Florida's attorney general intervenes, then Florida's attorney general must defend the statute and argue that it is constitutional. Have there been federal attorney generals under the federal constitution who have argued that the laws of Congress are unconstitutional? Yes, there have. Is that permitted under Florida's constitution? No, it is not. Florida's constitution says Florida's attorney general, if intervening in a case, must take the position of defense, must argue that the law is constitutional, and may not, NOT, may not argue that the law is unconstitutional. By that background, I ask you this question. Florida's attorney general, in defending the constitution of a statute, creating an exception to the Sunshine Law, concedes that the particular public necessity as stated in the law no longer exists. But, says Florida's Attorney General, there are at least three other good reasons for this particular exception to the Sunshine Law. I've pled and proven those three valid, important, critical, and necessary reasons for this exception to the Sunshine Law. Who wins that suit? Is this law unconstitutional? Who's the winner under that hypothetical? Who won? The Attorney General came up with not one, not two, but three. Three reasons that it's necessary, valid, important, and critical that we have this particular exception. Now, none of those three proven by the Attorney General the one that you see on the face of the statute. So who won? Public. You say the public won. I tell you, when you're talking about such a law, if you're rooting for the public, you're probably rooting for the winning team. And you are correct. Under this hypothetical, the public won. Why is that? Why is this law unconstitutional? Because the concession made by the Attorney General was that the reason given on the face of the law is not valid. And that concession, despite the subsequent proof of three other great reasons for this exception, that concession was fatal to the Attorney General's case. That exception meant that the law is facially unconstitutional. This is unique to the Sunshine Law. When we litigate in constitutional law, great lawyering can sometimes carry the day. Perhaps a legislature passed a law for one reason. And perhaps that reason was no good at all, but perhaps you can go to court and come up with other reasons that satisfy the burden of proof. Then you win, except if it's a Florida Sunshine Law. We've tied your hands under the Florida Sunshine Law. We've made you put Florida legislature in the text of your law, what the reason for it was. 
and then we restricted your defense attorney. Only that reason is enough. Can't prove that reason? Law falls as unconstitutional. You had a question? So would that be a valid, valid argument for the attorney general? If they felt that it was unconstitutional, can they concede that in their argument but try to raise other things? Or would that be like kind of malpractice on the attorney general? Oh, you, your question raises a couple of points. First, it's unconstitutional for Florida's attorney general to take a position of attack and to argue that a law or ordinance of Florida is unconstitutional. I get that. So the attorney general of the state of Florida has a job to do, and it's spelled out by the Constitution, and there's less discretion as to what position Florida's attorney general is in. Florida's attorney general is the defender of Florida's laws and ordinances. That's required by the Constitution. So it's more than malpractice, it's an unconstitutional act by Florida's attorney general. But the other part of your question, uh, help me help me give you a good answer to that. What, what so, so basically, they, even if, so they can't concede at all in their Well, in this hypothetical, the attorney general can't concede that the, the reason stated on the law is insufficient because it's a sunshine law. And on a sunshine law, we're restricted to just the reason that appears in the face of the law. Remember, they couldn't pass the law to begin with without stating that on its face. You remember from our prior discussion, to pass it without stating on its face made it facially unconstitutional. But now I add that if you can't uphold that stated reason, then again, the statute is unconstitutional. So in other constitutional litigation, you've got more leeway as the lawyer defending the act to come up with reasons why it's constitutional. But we've given you less leeway when the law you're trying to defend is an exception to Florida Sunshine Law. Yes. Nope, I thought I saw a hand. Nope. Okay. So the answer here then is that the Florida Attorney General conceded the wrong thing. And by conceding that, the Sunshine Law became facially unconstitutional and became unenforceable. And what I'm hoping to show with this particular hypothetical is the higher burden because it's a Sunshine Law, because it's an exception to a Sunshine Law. We know that the Florida legislature has the power to enact exceptions. There can be enact, enacted exceptions to the Sunshine Law, but remember those three requirements. The first requirement is that we have to specify the public necessity for the exception on the face. And then it can be no broader than necessary to accomplish that stated necessity. And then no other subject matter other than the exception and its enforcement appears within that. These three strict requirements were for a reason. And it was that reason I was trying to highlight in my hypothetical. Because when later we litigate whether or not this statute falls as unconstitutional, we're limited to the particular reason stated on the face. We're limited to that reason, the public necessity for the exception that was stated on the face of the law. I think we've got time for one more. Article 4, Section 8A of the Florida Constitution instructs the governor and his cabinet in great detail exactly how to dispense pardons and other forms of clemency. The governor and his cabinet follow those details perfectly. And in so doing, the governor and his cabinet have denied public access to part of the procedure. Did the governor and his cabinet violate the sunshine law. No, no. Who says no? Raise your hand if you say no. Raise your hand if you'd like to be correct. You are correct. The answer is no. Do you remember why? Because when Florida's constitution states in detail exactly how to do a thing, then doing that thing in another way is unconstitutional. When Florida's constitution states in detail a way to do a thing, then doing that thing in a different way is unconstitutional constitutional. So what we had here in that particular subsection is exactly how to grant parts of clemency. That's exactly how the governor and his cabinet did it. So that's exactly a constitutional way of doing things. When I see you next week, let's look at the specific case law precedent that we've got in our casebook. Let's look at those specific applications of Florida's Sunshine Law. 
let's learn the details that we didn't cover in this overview. But I hope this overview makes you better prepared to interpret that case law and ultimately makes you better prepared to defend your own rights and the rights of your federal fellow Floridians when it comes to Florida's sunshine law. Until I see you again next week, may God bless each and every one of you. I wish you success. Specifically, I wish you success in this class. Specifically, I wish you success in that graded essay that I handed out. Please take that one seriously and knock it out of the park. I would love to give each and every one of you an A. So just give me an excuse to do that, would you? Thank you. Good night. See you in a week. Small question. 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 Oh, you're right. No, that's fine. Sure.